Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to Midday Live on TV3, coming to you live from our studio here at Adesawe in Accra. My name is Martin Asiedu Dati. Coming up within the next one hour. Families of four Takrati girls confirmed dead reject the DNA results. We're going live to Takrati for an update. Also, security personnel from Accra region stationed at the Black Star Square to maintain law and order for the computerized school selection and placement uh, brouhaha over there. On the international front, South Africa apologizes to Nigeria over the spate of xenophobic attacks in that country. Well, thank you very much for staying with us. We have details of all these stories and more, including uh, entertainment and business as well, all lined up for you. Now, let's go to that story that we all uh, heard late last night, which has to do with the four girls being confirmed dead by the police uh, administration. So the DNA test conducted on some human remains discovered uh, in the course of police investigations into the disappearance of four girls in Takrade has proven positive as the remains of the girls. Acting Inspector General of Police James Opombuenu, who disclosed this in a media briefing in Accra, named the victims as Ruth Abaka, Prisla Blessing Bentum, and Ruth Lovequason and Prisla Crunchy uh, as the girls whose remains were found. Before we bring you that story, though, let's go live to the Ashanti, to the Western region, I beg your pardon, where our, my colleague has been interacting with some family members and, you know, other residents in and around the Takrade region. So what can you report? Yes, we did that, and the results is showing that they are the girls. They didn't come with anything, just verbally, around 7.30, to, to come and break search news to a mother. What kind of uh, guy, uh, 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 world are we living in? It's not, it's not fair. So we are not taking this thing lightly. Serious, we will never accept it. I'll come back to you. You also say you don't accept the results? You don't accept. That was not the condition. You agree with the doctors. You agree with the doctors. Having the, uh, taken the process of the DNA, the result will be communicated. Having you all assemble and explain the process to us. So now that they have done nothing about this, you are not going to accept what they have uh, done to us. Is it the case that you doubt the process or what? You doubt the process and the information. How can you not? The IGP doesn't know how you confirm that they are the, uh, the victim. The data, you don't accept it. And you will never accept it. They just want to, uh, the police just want to close their docket. But you are not going to allow them to close it. The docket will be still open. What are you going to do? You are going to, you are going to force them to bring the, uh, the right uh, thing. They should do that because they are being paid by our taxes. And if it were a, a, a minister, a, a government official, they were a millionaire, doctor or children, they won't tell us what they are doing because you don't have penny or they feel that you are poor. That's why they are doing this to us. Uh, which other way are you going to reassure yourselves that the results are a true reflection or not? Oh, in the first place, we will demand the bones because as it stands now, nobody has set their eyes on the bones. We have not seen the bones. So, fine. If truly the bones are the girls, they should give the bones to us. We will conduct our own test. We will plead to Ghanaians, whoever is ready to support the families because we have to know what exactly happened. We have to get to the top of this thing. So, we will plead to Ghanaians. And secondly, we are begging Nanado to sit up on this issue because in the first place, the CID is still working. The CID, the Amatepe, is still working. The commander, Mr. Uh, 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 Donko, Foli Donko, he, he, he's still working. So what are they trying to tell us? They are the one who collect the money from the guy and open the, the, the cell for the guy to escape. So we want them to brought to justice, all these people. Okay. So from here, what's next? Uh, we are going to uh, uh, do our, we are going to collaborate to do the, uh, our own investigation. What you want them to do, they should present the result to us. They have to present the result. How they came by their uh, result, they should bring it to us. 
to us to also to make our own. Whether you are going to Japan, China, or America to conduct it, you shall do it. Uh, this morning, when I spoke with you, you mentioned that you've not been officially informed. Nothing. Nobody has come to us to inform us officially. And there, 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 there is no police. No other person has ever come to us that uh, your, your granddaughter is dead. No. As the IGP said, it's never yes, true. In, in his press conference, he mentioned that he's... It's never contact- true. It's never true. IGP is never true. You see, this is how they mislead the uh, president and the ministers. Yes. Somebody far away will come and tell the story. Will that verify it and you prove that? While he was giving the uh, press conference, I heard that a policeman has gone one of our veterans' family. Yes. Why he was speaking, but he has already said he has sent. He has sent, yes. Not sending, sent. People to this. So what, what, what are they saying? It's never true. Now they are going to tell RGB that you have informed the four victims. It's never true. To me, I heard the news from Joy News. Uh, earlier, you also told me that your wife collapsed on hearing the news. Collapsed because of their very uh, uh, pro, uh, pronouncement. So, he collapsed. So, so how, how is she feeling now? Now, uh, by the grace of God, he is reviving. It's reviving. Okay. So I want to ask you the same question from here. What's next? Oh, uh, we will. All the family will come in an agreement, and we will go to Accra because we have to. They have to answer some questions to us. So we will go to Accra, and and secondly, we have to collect the bones and do our own test too. Okay. Uh, midway in your press conference, you did reiterate your call for the dismissal of the police CID boss. Yes, that one should. Uh, the government has to sit on it. The government has to do it. Because uh, around on the 3rd, on the 4th June, uh, Madam Tiwa called my mom, telling my mom that where the girls are, the kidnappers are demanding a huge sum of money. So how come they are telling us that the bones are the girls? Then it means uh, Madam Tiwa lied to all Ghanaians. They lied to us. So that that woman has to step down. Seriously, he doesn't, she doesn't know what she's doing. Okay. Um, this morning again, you narrated a story to me that last week you had a call from Accra somewhere that... No, last week, just Friday. Just Friday. Somebody rang us with their number. You have given their number. Mm-hmm. The person's name, his location, her location to Ghana Police Crime Officer, Western Region. That's what? That somebody has rang that. He has seen my granddaughter. You mean Ruth Abakan? Ruth Abakan at Swatum last spot in the night. Every night he sees them, but he doesn't know that until he saw their picture in the media that these people are missing. So he's prepared. She's prepared to accompany us to where they are. But in the daytime, you won't see them. In the nighttime, under the traffic lights, that you'll see them. And I've given all this very information to uh, Ghana police. That you had a call from somebody. I have given the number. The number has been given to them. Uh, the name and the location has been given to them on Friday. Okay. La- just last week. Friday. Just Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. That you say okay. uh, the person says. And this makes you more convinced. Convinced that, that they are lying. This makes me convinced that they are lying. And even after the process that they told us, they will come and do it to us. They have done nothing about it. Okay. They told us they won't tell. They will air the thing to. Anybody, but rather they will assemble us at the police headquarters and demonstrate. That is the way they will demonstrate how they got to know the result, okay. whether negative or positive. Is that the demonstration that they are doing? So that is our correspondent in the Western Region, Erica J, interacting with some of the family members of these three, uh, in fact, now four uh, ladies who were missing in Takradi. Confirmation is that they are the ones that were, um, unfortunately, it is their remains that were found. So let's bring you that story, specifically what the IGP said when he met the media last night. For close to two hours, some members of the police top management team filed in, led by the acting Inspector General James Opong Bueno, and after an apology from the Director General of Police Public Affairs Directorate, ACP David Senanu Eklu, acting Inspector General James Opong Bueno confirmed the results and apologized for their inability to save the lives of the girls. A few minutes ago, officers of the Ghana Police Service informed four families in Takradi, in the Western region, that DNA tests conducted on some human remains 
discovered in the course of police investigations into the disappearance of four girls have turned positive as the remains of the girls. The Ghana Police Service has, with regret, therefore informed the families that the remains are those of Ruth Abaka, Prisla Blessing Bintum, Ruth Love Quazen, and Prisla Crunchy. Investigations now establish that the girls were victims of a serial kidnapping and murdering syndicate that operated in the Takradi area. While for various reasons we are unsuccessful in obtaining and acting on accurate, actionable intelligence in good time to enable us to rescue the girls, we believe that the arrest of the corporates has effectively thwarted the ability of this syndicate to have continued with further kidnappings and murders. James Opon Bueno went ahead to spell out the steps taken by the police since the incident occurred. On the 22nd day of December 2018, one day after the disappearance of Mantibia, the police was able to track the number through which some ransom had been paid. This led to the arrest of suspect Samuel Odue took Wills to assist with the investigation. Samuel Wills later escaped from police custody on the 30th of December 2018, but was re-arrested three days later in an uncompleted building at Nkrofo, which is a suburb of Takradi. Yeah, and he was brought to the CID headquarters where upon interrogation he admitted that he Together with suspects John Oji and John Shika, kidnapped the young girls and sent them by road to a location in Nigeria known as Baby Factory in Anambra State. He, however, denied knowledge of the whereabouts of Ruth Abeka. The evaluation of this confession and other intelligence reports from Nigeria on the location and modus operandi of this baby factory culminated in an assessment by the investigation team at this stage that they had a fair idea of the location of the girls and that it will be possible to bring them home. Between April and July 2019, several surveillance operations were mounted in Onicha, Oka, Port Harcourt, and Calabar in Nigeria. These were locations where suspects Samuel Odua took wills emphatically mentioned at different times as places where the girls were sent and directed investigation teams to, with the hope of tracing and rescuing the girls. Upon collaboration with other intelligence and investigative agencies across West Africa, the second suspect, John Oji, was tracked and arrested at the flower border on 4 June 2019. During interrogation, John Oji admitted to knowing Samuel, but denied knowledge of any kidnapping. The two suspects were put together for questioning. And while Samuel insisted that John knew where the girls were, John, on the other hand, maintained his denial of any involvement in the kidnapping of the girls. So what next in the missing Takradi girls debacle? While we wish we had actionable intelligence in good time to have rescued the girls alive, the painstaking investigations nonetheless have contributed to ensuring that the persons responsible are brought before the law and prevented from carrying out other similar crimes in the future. The suspects will be processed for court upon completion of the case docket and advice from the Office of the Attorney General. But the claim that the families were informed prior to the media briefing was vehemently denied. Nothing, nobody has come to us to inform us officially. And there, 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 there is no police. No other person has ever come to us that uh, your, your granddaughter is dead. No. As the IGP said, it's never true. Why he was giving the uh, press conference, I heard that a policeman has gone one of our victims' family. Why he was speaking, but he has already said he has sent, yes. not sending, sent people to this. So what, what, what are they saying? To me, I heard the news from Joy News. Because in the first place, the way they came to announce the thing is not even fair. At least they should rather come with some reports showing that, okay, fine, ABC, we did this, we did that, and the results is showing that they are the girls. They didn't come with anything, just verbally around something to, to come and break such news to a mother. What kind of a, 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 a world are we living in? It's not, it's not fair. So we are not taking this thing lightly. Serious. We will never accept it. 
Well, clearly it's uh, still um, an unfolding story in terms of the reactions because uh, the confirmation that the Takradi missing girls are indeed dead has come with mixed reactions coupled with anger. In the following news desk report, we take a look at the chronology of events and how it unfolded to this unfortunate uh, announcement that was made by the police, CI, PI, the police IGP, I beg your pardon. 21-year-old student of the University of Education, Winneba, Prisla Bentum, who was on her way back home from work, went missing. The family was contacted by her kidnappers and a ransom of 4,000 CDs was paid. It turns out the money was not up to the expected amount by the kidnappers. Four months later, in December, another girl went missing, 18-year-old Ruth Love Quason, on the promise of an MTN job, innocent Ruth Love Quason was lured out and kidnapped. Less than two weeks after, while the Quason family was yet to come to terms with what was happening, another girl went missing, Presla Mantebia Crunchy, 15 years of age. On December 22, a day after Mantebia went missing, prime suspect Samuel Wills was captured. He was in court on December 24 and remanded to reappear for commencement of proceedings on January 29. But on December 30, 2018, Samuel Wills escaped custody of the Takwadi Central Police Station. Seven policemen from the Takwadi Metropolitan Police Command, under whose watch the suspected kidnapper escaped, were interdicted and given a 10 day ultimatum to rearrest the suspect or face disciplinary action. Samuel Walsh was rearrested on January 3 in his hideout, an uncompleted building at Cancerado, less than 800 meters from the house of kidnapped Ruth Lapkason. In court on January 9, Samuel Walls alleged two individuals, one Quisi and John, with the help of a CID officer, helped him escape. A major upset happened when the police failed to produce Samuel Wills in court because he was in Accra and couldn't be brought to the Takrade Market Security Court. This incensed the residents of Takrade, who organized a massive vigil to press home their demands. Three months after Samuel Wills' case started, the court ruled charging Samuel Wills on three counts and sentencing him to 18 months imprisonment for escaping lawful custody. On April 2, 2019, at the height of the grief of the families, Director General of Police CID, COP Mamiya Tiwa Adudankwa, assured them that the police knew the whereabouts of the missing girls and will very soon be reunited with them. The assurance to the family is that they should keep on keeping on. The ladies, they will know where they are and they are safe. Their hope was, however, short-lived when three weeks after the assurance, the CID boss chose to rather deepen their woes on Mother's Day. But this wasn't the only promise that had seemed to raise hopes. On April 24, a major circulating daily newspaper, The Daily Guide, published a headline story stating the three kidnapped girls were rescued and were undergoing medical checks and will soon be handed over to the police. On June 10, 2019, the police picked up another suspect described as the mastermind behind the Takrade girls' kidnapping. He was picked up in Togo. A month to a year since the first kidnapping, the three families organized a media conference to demand intervention of the diplomatic mission. Their demand came on the back of the rescue of some foreign national who had been kidnapped. The speed and time of their rescue got the families of the three kidnapped girls worried. They may have been taken for granted for long, but on July 15, while on a tour in the western region, the president assured the family's government had not given up on the girls. <laughs> We did for the year, Juma, and see a choir, year fa, year fa, a bit to me, I heard, yet dear Mofrano, Obia, and now, yet to be now, was same thing. If you are answered and cut about the other, the Kadi, if you don't be kind and say, you have that, and to me, Banasa, can a former CBBSC, not any emphatic, and self-quenbias, I buy, then I want the name to me, 
Interestingly, on August 2, news broke about human body remains retrieved from septic tank behind the house of prime suspect Samuel Wills. The police later confirmed the said report and indicating two skulls and other human body remains were retrieved and transferred to Accra for further forensic investigations. A fourth body was also recovered from a well at Nkofu New site in Takrade, the western regional capital, by police investigators. The remains were discovered. Unfortunately, um, we are, the worst fears of many seem to have uh, been confirmed by the police. Well, that's what the police is saying. But let's go to Skype now and speak to uh, Adam Bona. He is a security analyst and uh, also the chief executive officer of the Security Warehouse Limited. On what his preliminary, uh, you know, reaction is to this news that uh, we uh, unfortunately are hearing from the police CI, the police um, leadership. Mr. Bona, good afternoon and thank you for joining us. Good afternoon, and it, it, good afternoon to your viewers. If you follow social media commentary, it looked as if the police service was preparing our minds to today. As a security analyst uh, who's also followed this particular story quite keenly, did you also get that sense that, well, the people are dead, but that the police wanted us to, they wanted to soften the blow for the, the citizenry? Did you get that sense as well? Well, uh, yes, rightly so. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I got that sense, but uh, from day one, some of us actually. I mean, I think I spoke. Your station is one of the stations I spoke to, and I said, chances of recovering or rescuing them alive, uh, you know, wasn't that good because looking at the time lost, and so I would say that. Uh, I am not surprised with regards to uh, the eventual uh, findings by the DNA test and the eventual discovery of some of, of the uh, remains in the septic tank. I am not surprised because anyone who knows, uh, you know, this type of kidnapping, there are different types. Anyone who knows this type, the longer it goes on, the you know chances of recovering or rescuing slim and slimmer. And so I'm not surprised at all. But how should we take this um, from the security point of view? Should this actually embolden us to believe and trust in the work of the police? Or really, uh, there seems to be a general um, discontent about how the police has handled this entire process of investigation and the way they've even announced it to the, to the public. The family was not contacted in time before the public announcement was made. And there have been so many more questions being asked after the announcement was made. What do you make of this in, in terms of how the police handled the, the, the situation? For me, I, I think that uh, condolences to the family, the bereaved families and all that. Uh, what I can say to this is to say this is not one of the conventional crimes our Ghana police service, they, they, they know of. And therefore, we would have to learn, would have to allow ourselves to do some self-introspection. Let's not just throw a hand and say the police didn't do a good job. I personally have taken, I took keen interest in, um, you know, following this day by day. And I can attest to the fact that they have done a lot of work, you know, in terms of this case. And uh, for, for where we are today, uh, yes, if the families and the families and some people don't have any belief in the police, I would say, well, uh, we can only support the police because they are the only state-mandated institution when it comes to uh, this type of crimes we, we would have to rely on and urge that they put in more measures. But that remains that, you see, uh, kidnapping of this nature could either be positive or negative. The truth also remains that since these missing girls, in fact, went viral, all other kidnapping cases that were reported officially, the police have rescued all of them, including uh, the lady who was kidnapped and uh, the house were killed around the Amasaman area and all others, including the Canadians. And so let's not lose facts of, you know, what the police have done and attempt to run them down. It's not the time to run them down. Doing that 
for us as a people is very dangerous. So we've got to support the police, even though we need to ask questions, lest any attempt to hand them down will be detrimental to all of us in terms of fighting crime mm. such as this, because they've done a lot of work, uh, you know, bring us where we are. And I would say that at least we have some finality in this whole uh, kidnapping saga. And uh, my final question to you would be, I mean, there's mounting pressure on uh, the head of the CID, uh, Madam Tiwa, to resign. Do you think that uh, it's a legitimate call? It is, it is not legitimate at all. You see, you've got to speak to uh, police officers who work with her. You've got to speak to her colleagues. Then you would know how diligent she is, you know, doing her work. And so it's unfortunate to know it. Who don't know? the work of the criminal investigation department who don't know what they do would be calling for this. But the truth is that this case was first reported at Takaradi before it came to Accra. And so we've got to be very fair and balanced, you know, in demanding for some of these things because as far as I'm concerned, mm. she has done a good job and I don't see among the current, you know, police, I don't see anyone who could have done this better than her. Mm. And so as far as I'm concerned, I think she had a good job. Uh, the call for her to resign is completely, uh, you know, unfortunate. It, it's not there. I mean, it's completely okay. unfortunate at all. At oh. all. Misplaced, you know, call. Thank you. Thank you so much, as always, for making time to speak with us. Adam Bonner is a security analyst and the chief executive officer of the Security Warehouse Limited, uh, sharing his security perspectives on this subject matter. But let's look at it from the clinical psychologist point of view. We've been joined in the studio by Dr. Samuel um, Ajololo. He's a forensic clinical psychologist and has also been following public discourse and uh, this particular story quite keenly. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you for joining us. Um, the family, some are saying, is living in denial. Various families are living in denial following this report. They say, one, they do not believe the report. Two, they think that they would want to go ahead and do their own testing. Do you think that it is a psychological problem they are battling with or truly that it, it's a fair call that they want to also do their testing before they can believe this? Well, good afternoon. And thank you for having me. And before I attempt to respond to the question you asked, the fundamental question is, where, why did we get here in the first place? What did we do wrong from the beginning to warrant this denial of the report? Clearly, right from the beginning, just as Bonaf said, there are two sides to a crime. There's that physical investigation component, mm -hmm. and there's also the psychological part. But in most cases here in Ghana, the focus has been on the physical investigation. So as long as you are looking for the perpetrators, whatever the family or the victims are going through is secondary, is tangential to the case. And so there's less attention to that particular area. Now, if you could recall clearly that it took the cry of the public and the media before the police even thought it professional to even mm. send someone to the family to provide some amount of psychological support. Mm -hmm. That in itself is not enough because psychological supports or mental health services are not drugs that you take. It, they depend on establishing rapport. Right. And rapport takes several weeks to, 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 to establish. Mm. So you can send somebody there today, tomorrow, and then we come and sit and, and say that we have provided psychological. Okay. That is just not enough. Right. So I was hoping that they will have someone dedicated or who will be stationed there, who will be supporting these families as they transition through this process. Okay. That wasn't done. Let's leave it there. Now you told the family that you, 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 you take their samples to do a DNA testing. Initially there was a resistance. Again, there were persuasions and they agreed in. Now all these things are indication that something needs to be done differently. Mm. Unfortunately, that wasn't recognized. Mm. So we went ahead and did the DNA. And I was expecting that as part of the process, because now the family is a major uh, stakeholder in this whole in thing. The, in the case. So it's more reasonable to include them as partners in the process. They may not go to the lab, but it's expected reasonably that on daily basis or as and when it is necessary, they'll be getting you keep them fit, you keep them in the communication loop. Yes, um, so all, all of that seem not to have happened and we are the worst fears of many in fact including the family has been confirmed 
from here, what next? What do you, as, as a clinical psychologist, what would your advice to the family be in handling the post announcement? Right. So granted that there were no errors, there were no anomalies, and that the results are genuine as they are supposed to be, then the family is in a state of denial, which itself is a good sign because it's a loss. The stages you go through, and the first of them is denial. Mm. But the police can smoothen that process. They can emollify it if they engage them in the process so that they are involved. In that case, the acceptance will be easier. Okay. So the family will certainly come to terms with the reality. But Rana, because of the mistrust, because of the, the communication gap that existed between the police force and them, they are thinking otherwise. That maybe perhaps the results are fabricated. Mm. And so in that case, why should I accept it? So that's a, that's, a, that's a family part. How about you and I, the ordinary Ghanaian who also has lost some kind of credibility in the police? How do we also react or take this? You see, so I was, li I was listening to Bona and I agree to, a, to some extent on the things he's saying. But I also think that sometimes we, ha we just have to take responsibilities for our misconduct. Right. And if possible, do the do. In fact, do the right thing so that some things do not happen again. Mm. Like the case of Tiwa. If here were a country where people are serious and things are done seriously, mm. Tiwa wouldn't be at post. Yes. Honestly, if it were to be in the UK or those other countries, she wouldn't be here. So to say the call for her to resign is uncalled for, to me, I think otherwise. Okay. You see, because once we allow some of these things to go, we are not learning from our mistakes because this is not the first time this thing has happened. Something like this has happened. We have been battling crime over the years. All right. But involving others who are key stakeholders has been left to the hook. We'll have to leave it here for now. Certainly this is still an unfolding and a developing story, although uh, the confirmation has come from the police that the four ladies are dead. Uh, there are various new angles that are coming. The family is yet to collect the remains. Will the police even release those remains to the family to undertake their own private testing? We'll check on that. We've been speaking with Dr. Samuel Ajolulu. He's a forensic clinical psychologist. There is more to come on Midday Live. Stay with us. Thank you very much for staying with us. Let's shift our attention to some other stories now. And as part of our agenda, focusing on abandoned projects today, we look at the abandoned Kaswa Polyclinic. Well, you are greeted with weeds, dust, and cobwebs at the Kaswa Polyclinic. The facility, even though completed, has been abandoned. Let's go live and speak with my colleague, AC Binewa Nyame, who has uh, joined us live and is monitoring what's happening there. Uh, He's joined us now. built 80 bed capacity Kaswa Polyclinic. And uh, one of the uh, areas, so probably this may be the uh, OPD or the, air, um, the waiting area, I guess. And so this is how the place looks like. Uh, uh, right now, because there's nothing ongoing here, most of the, uh, probably the consulting rooms are locked. I tried to peep in through some of them to see exactly uh, what is in there. And um, what can I see here? So we have fans fitted, we have lights, uh, we have everything, uh, but uh, the place is locked, so we cannot see. So if you can have a feel of how the place looks like, it's neatly uh, painted, a yellow, some creamy color, a very nice looking area, but uh, as you can see, the place is, uh, is it dejected or dissected or abandoned, as you may see. Let us uh, get outside here and see exactly how the place also looks like. So this is actually uh, the back of the uh, main building and uh, if you can see in your shots now uh, this is how it looks like so uh, very witty uh, and I guess this should be the uh, the uh, the warts I, 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 I really think so so these are the warts and this is how the, the this particular area looks like uh, I can see weeds the place is filled with weeds um, I can also see some fire extinguishers. So before we, we came to the back of this place, we also uh, went around the, the entire place. And uh, I can tell you that I can see some uh, people from the uh, electricity company, or uh, PDS or <laughs> whatever it is. So they are also trying, they are working on the main lights outside. Some poles have been fitted in there, uh, some street lights also as well. And some polytanks also right at the back of this particular uh, building 
building, we'll try and bring all those visuals to you subsequently in our bulletin. But right about now, this is how uh, the place looks like. Everything uh, looks a bit new, but uh, with the exception of the, the environment, weedy, dusty, uh, cobwebs all over the place. And uh, we'll also try and speak with the MCE for the area to also know exactly what the state of this particular project is. So. Uh, Right about now, I can tell you that the place is abandoned. Nothing really ongoing in terms of using this facility. Right, thank you very much, AC Benua Nyame, with that update from uh, Kaswa. Now let's go to Skype now and speak with Professor Albert Puni. He is a lecturer uh, in leadership and governance at the University of Professional Studies. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you very much for joining us. Hello, Mr. Puni, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Great. Uh, I think my background is a little bit noisy. We, we'll, we, we, can, manage, we can manage with that. But uh, to start with, we here at Media General are waging a campaign to get government to at least speak to some of these abandoned projects. Some are saying it is a waste of the resources or the funding from the citizenry. Where do you stand on this? That the, the lack of continuation of such projects is taking a toll on the state budget. Can the citizenry take some other action against the state for abandoning some of these projects? Thank you very much. And then uh, good afternoon to your viewers. I think that if you look into history, uh, these abandoned projects, you can trace from Nkrumah regime to a champion, to Rollins, and then now we are in the Pope Republic. Mm. And this, the same thing is happening. I think what we have to be doing is that media and then civil society to be advocating so that our politicians will know that government is a continuum and then you don't abandon project from your predecessor. Mm. I think the constitution has granted that continuity but it's just the politicians don't want to and then the problem is that the problem is that we don't have a, a, a holistic national agenda mm. we are being governed by party manifesto and that is actually creating a lot of problems so we have to through the media and civil society we have to be engaging and then talking about the whole issue because but it is the task PS money that this. Right, but, but if you say that we are governed by the manifestos of the political parties, whoever uh, comes into power, what then is the role of the NDPC, for instance, the National Planning Development Commission? They are supposed to at least draft an agenda, and under it will definitely have infrastructural development. So if there are clearly stated infrastructural development agenda that any government that comes into power must follow, and someone is not following, what can be done in this instance? We all know that uh, the NDPC uh, plan is something that uh, the party themselves don't agree the methodology. That some were talking about some some years, others are saying 50 years. We don't have a consensus on the on the plan. So once you don't have a consensus on the, any plan, the implementation becomes a problem. So what we have now is that. A party comes with this manifesto, sell the manifesto to citizens, and then citizens vote for the, the party. So the party will now have to implement its own uh, promises. That is what we're having now. So I think once you are waiting a war like that, any other civil society grouping can also join it. Right. And then we be waiting well like, things like that because it's not going to be good for us. Okay. Going forward. All right. Thank you for making time to speak with us. We know you are at a conference in South Africa, far away South Africa, but thank you very much for making time to speak with us. Professor uh, Albert Puning is a lecturer in leadership and governance at the University of Professional Studies, uh, UPS here in Accra. So at Media General, we are keeping our campaign on and uh, we hope that the uh, government responds to this and successive governments are able to complete projects that are started whichever party is in power. Stay with us. There's more to come on Midday Live.
Thank you very much for staying with TV3. This is Midday Live. Let's go to business now. The Coalition of Aggrieved Customers of Gold Coast Fund Management has given a one-month ultimatum for the release of their monies or risk a protest in Accra, a petition to the president and the U.S. government. Over 5 billion CDs of invest investors' funds are locked up with the company. Gold Coast Fund Management, a subsidiary of Group Indum, has about 800,000 customers. Individual investment ranges between 1,000 cities to 50 million cities. Secretary of the aggrieved customers, Joseph Ni Aite Ama, wants the president to intervene. We believe that it is high time the presidency needs to step into this situation because this situation is more terrible than the DKM story which the president spoke about, which the current president, then a candidate, spoke about in the Brown and Hafu region. And this situation we are in today is even more serious than the men's gold situation. Another customer, Alex Apia, says his business plans have been stifled. The sad uh, side of it is that you save your money with a, a, a financial institution and you want to retrieve the money, you can't get it. As I'm standing here, I can't even get money to pay my suppliers because Dr. Kwesin Doom is holding my money. According to the aggrieved customers, Gold Coast Fund managers are yet to pay back their fixed deposit investment, which the company says had matured since June last year. 76-year-old retiree Dora Jansa narrated her predicament. I wanted to take part of my investment to repair my house, but could not get it. I went to the rich office, but place was closed. On my way back, I got a call that my house was on fire. In rushing to the ridge office, I left a radio set on charge, causing the fire. The Securities and Exchange Commission has ordered fund managers not to accept new deposits to avert the use of new investment to pay existing debt. Like many other customers, retiree Charles Nelson, who was a client of GN Bank, was introduced to the Gold Coast Fund Management by officials of GN Bank. All attempts to retrieve his investment in both GN Bank and the fund managers have failed. Even All right, so that's it for business. And uh, there's news just coming in. So the, the education minister has been parrying questions from the media on the computer placement challenges. Uh, this morning, reporters pushed him to answer questions but failed uh, to get any answer from him. Let's watch this. The media, honorable, we want some response to their placement issues. We know this is actually a for teacher. Mm -hmm. okay, 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 Time now for international news. And in international news, South Africa has apologized to Nigeria over the spate of xenophobic attacks, uh, which led to a spike in tensions between the two countries. And Nigeria has accepted that apology. We have details of that in our subsequent bulletins. Uh, we know that 12 people were killed earlier when those attacks started in South Africa. Time now, though, for entertainment news. So you know that last week, Friday, we launched Mentor, uh, the biggest music entertainment program reality show in Ghana. Now we tried to contact some of the past Mentor winners, and this is the expectations of the new season of Mentor. Mentor's gonna take you higher. Mentor's gonna take you there. Stick to 
see something better from the new contestants that are going to start the show. And I believe that is going to be awesome. It's going to be what I'm expecting really, it's the aftermath. When the show is done, how they're going to take care of their contestants, I mean, manage them and keep them in the limelight. Because some of us, we've worked hard. For a company to make availability for people to showcase their talent is a good thing. But my advice is we should make sure that when we finish, we should follow up in helping the people to reach where they want to. And then my advice to the contestants coming is that they should be humble and learn a lot. Whatever they will be taught in here, they should learn it because it take them far. About a surprise charge, I'm just praying, I'm just hoping at least every Marco Kukumante, honestly. Uh, every past contestant is wishing the surprise judge Ebe Marco Kukuman. And I urge everybody to take his or her chances. Mentor really takes you higher. As part of a bigger plan to support the career of hopefuls, platforms will be provided to promote their music and videos. To them, the move will ensure that contestants are not left hanging after the show. Then it's a good package. A package that is not going to leave them halfway, but it's going to see them through at least to the top. It's a good package and big up to TV3. When I saw the after plans and all that, I was very, very, very much excited about it. Kudos to TV3 for all of those plans. The prize package for Mentor Reloaded is also a major talking point. The past contestants are excited about the irresistible two-bedroom house price tag. For some, if they had their way, they will once again give it a try. Trust me. Every past contestant would love to be back. <laughs> it's so, so huge. I wish I could contest again. This actually would encourage them to perform more. I think this would be one of the best mentors of all time. The excitement is where the two bedroom is. I, I feel like coming back again to, <laughs> to, to contest. You stand the chance of winning a two bedroom house. And of course, the bragging rights plus other fantastic prizes. Two bedroom house. I am contesting, my entire family is contesting. We are coming for auditions because at least that house must come to my family. But you can also contest, follow us on social media and get all the updates and details of which region when we are coming for auditions there and then you will also be able to contest. That's it for the news. It came your way from our studio here at Adesanwe in Accra. I'm Martin Asedi Thank you very much for watching. Always stay positive. Bye for now.